today today's uh, well-being webinar. This is uh, it's the third in our series. Um, this is focused, like I said, on well-being um, and productivity, and looking at it from a home working perspective. But also, we're looking at hybrid as well as uh, as things are moving towards that area. Um, I've got it. I'm really really delighted to have a really excellent panel with us today, um, and I'll introduce those guys shortly. Um, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions throughout the session. So if you do want to ask a question, please, please take the opportunity. Um, it's a QA and a at the bottom, post your question, and I will endeavour to ask the panellists the, the, the question you ask. If we don't manage to get to, to, to doing that uh, or answering that question, we will make sure we get back to you after the session um, with a response. Um, I'm also going to be running some polls throughout the session to gauge the, the audience's opinion. Um, if you could please provide your 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 feedback on the, on the polls, um, that would be much appreciated. Um, there will be an opportunity after this session to, to if you miss anything or want to rehear any element of, of the session, you'll be able to go onto our YouTube channel and watch it in full again if you if you wanted to. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our expert panel. Um, I'm starting with, with Nick. Um, Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, a bit about thank it? you. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Nick Bishop and my business is called Nick Bishop Solutions. I've been working for myself for 16 years. Prior to that, I was managing a large contact centre for HBOS with about 250 people, both inbound and outbound. And my business is primarily geared around achieving peak performance for people and their teams. And that allows me also to work within the world of sports as well as business, because ultimately people are just people and teams are just teams and the way we think and the way we perform. Great. Andy? Uh, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Uh, hi, so my name's Andy Barker. I'm uh, one of the partners of uh, a training company called Mind Fitness. Um, and, uh, but my background is corporate. So uh, for, for many, many years, I headed up the customer service function for PlayStation at Sony, um, grew it from a small startup to uh, you know a massive um, blue chip company, um, uh, and obviously we know today it's a huge, uh, hugely successful uh, uh, part of the games industry. Um, Mind Fitness I set up uh, with my two partners about five six years ago to really look at um, a, a part of um, the, the kind of well being area that I'm passionate about, which is supporting mental health. And, and good mental health, but also supporting people who may be experiencing poor mental health. So we look at uh, training people around mental health, um, giving people um, skills around well-being and cognitive thinking, uh, cognitive um, uh, expertise, if you like, uh, and also around personal effectiveness. So everything you learn, you then apply to sort of business skills training. Uh, and our training involves uh, mindfulness, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but as a coaching platform. And we deliver everything through uh, creative learning. So that's Mind Fitness and that's me. Great. Um, Eileen? Hi, hello. My name's Eileen and I'm the founding director of Ripple & Co. I also had a corporate background. I spent 20 years working in the corporate sector, latterly as a director of a global FTSE 250. And my roles were senior level roles in corporate responsibility and sustainability. And I left the corporate sector around three years ago now to start up my own business in corporate mental health and well-being. So we're a team who now develop evidence-informed strategies around corporate health and, and well-being, and then the development of programs, which we also support on the implementation of as well. So um, I'm really looking forward to sharing some insights with you today, which will definitely be evidence-informed as well. Excellent. Thanks, Eileen. We did have Linda, but I'm afraid she's having a few connection issues. So uh, when Linda arrives, I'll, I'll introduce her or let her introduce herself even, um, which I hopefully, hopefully will be sh shortly. Um, OK, so as far as the topic is concerned, obviously, well-being, mental health, productivity, um, it, it's very much become a hot topic over the last, I would say, 18 months, probably beyond probably two years. Um, and obviously, that's been accelerated with the last 12 months with the pandemic especially with the move to homeworking, which has thrown up quite a new, a new set of issues, really. Um, the mass move to homeworking has certainly um, 
you know, I did, made I suppose exacerbated certain areas. Um, and so I think I think one of the things today we're, we're going to be looking at and, and investigating and debating is, is just how how that's impacted and also how and the measures you can take to potentially help and alleviate that and make sure that your staff are as as, as well as productive and as happy as possible. Um, so I guess uh, my first question, which is for you, Eileen, um, which is around the issue of of well-being. How, how much of an issue is it? What's your thoughts on that? Well, as you said, Jonathan, I think we started to put well-being and certainly we started to put mental health or mental ill health onto the agenda maybe two or three years ago in earnest, which was really driven, I think, by the reports that, that came out from companies such as Accenture and in particular Deloitte, who looked to quantify the impact that mental ill health was having on UK PLC. So their estimation in their second report published January 2020 was that UK PLC was, was putting the cost of up to £45 billion when it came to mental ill health, the majority of which actually was presentees and people being at work but not being productive. Um, but we know that just generally, globally, mental ill health is having a massive impact on business. The World Health Organization estimates that it's about $2.5 trillion annually. So those are really, really big figures, but what does it mean at a real granular level? Well, we know from some evidence that has come out of the Oxford Research Centre into call centre, contact centre workers, that there is a direct link between well-being and productivity. So if our productivity is being impacted by poor well-being, then that, of course, is a massive issue, particularly a massive issue as we are in recession and trying to pull ourselves back to, um, you know, to, to, to business health. So, so for me, I think this is really, really significant, particularly when the figures I quote are pre-pandemic. We know that during the lockdown that we have seen a doubling in anxiety. In fact, though, the record of anxiety has been at the highest levels ever recorded. And we know that feelings of low happiness have also doubled. And we're seeing that really just disproportionately across different areas of, of the population. We know that younger people have suffered the most. They have felt higher levels of anxiety, but also feelings of loneliness, significant feelings of loneliness. And I think we only, and we will get onto some of this, I guess, in terms of, you know, how are these younger people working? Well, they're working from really not ideal working conditions. And that, and, and also I remember, you know, the earlier stages of my career, work was everything it's where my friends were um and they've missed out on that so much and that of course will have an impact now and ongoing because you know leading neuroscientists are telling us that we are going to have a global pandemic of mental ill health following covid so a bit doom and gloom but we are here to talk about what we can do so hopefully that's the the light at the end of the tunnel yeah, absolutely. Um, it's quite frightening, isn't it? Um, so, so Andy, what where, what do you look for? Well, spot, how do you spot the warning signs of a distressed worker? Um, well, it, it can be very, very difficult, very challenging, because um, sometimes when somebody is feeling, um, you know, distress or struggling, there's a lot going on in trying to avoid people noticing it so it, you know it's not always evident and especially now you know we've got people working from home in these zoom environments you've you've got very little to to go on certainly things like body language you, you've got head and shoulders going on there so that can be more challenging but there are warning signs people do um, present things that can be clues and if you know what to look for but changes normally, the changes in demeanor, the changes that present themselves that somebody who's normally relatively calm can appear, you know, slightly more brittle or, or just, uh, you know, much more emotional, maybe emotional outbursts, that could be a sign. But similarly, somebody who that becomes overly quiet, who normally used to contribute. So withdrawal, uh, cameras going off, and I'm talking about this remote world that we're in, um, uh, just just not engaging, not being part of the the overall conversation can all be signs. Uh, uh, but change, just look for changes in people, and if those changes are evident, then that could be the sign of you need to have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. And then Nick, what about about isolation and about how to avoid isolation and sort of create a collaborative working environment? Yeah. I, I think this becomes even more critical when people are working remotely. Um, it's 
perhaps a well-known fact or maybe not so that when unemployment rises street gangs increase because people have a fundamental wanting to be part of a team a belonging they want to be a togetherness so the home office takes away all of our people interactions and i think it becomes really critical then on the leader to try to bring back together some kind of teamship and togetherness for the people um, whether that be um, specific zooms that they can take part in but yeah. just to bring people back into the party now some people will work from home quite well some I mean, my son who's 26 is working from home and he's loving it but it's not the same for everyone and i think we have to understand as we, we've already acknowledged that people are going to be different and how the way people perform but looking out for the world warning signs could be a little bit of sickness a little bit of labor turnover things like that just to make sure that we are doing everything for the employees yeah yeah so so i what, what's what's so critical to improving well-being i always say line managers so we know there are five key drivers of well-being in the workplace and the top two are health and relationships and we know from um, research that's come out of oxford research center that relationships particularly those with the line manager are absolutely fundamental and critical to the well-being of team members we know that 70 percent of our motivation comes from our line manager but unfortunately 75 percent of people would say that their boss is the most stressful part of their role so we've got a real um we've got a contradiction that we rely on our line manager a lot for our well-being or they they affect our well-being but also they can also affect it very very negatively as well i mean how many times do you do you leave a you leave a manager not a job and it's it's no coincidence that what that's what people say because of the, the impact the line manager can have so i think when we look at some of the other statistics that deloitte has has offered us we know that there is a good return on investment when people invest in well-being but one of the the interventions that has the best roi is the intervention which is training line managers to be more aware of mental Ill health, to be able to spot the signs and then be able to have a supportive conversation. That ROI goes all the way up to a potential one in 11, one in 10, one in 11. So I would say the, the most critical part is your line managers, invest in your line managers. Andy, what's your thoughts? Well, I'd, I'd agree with everything Eileen's just said. And, and just to add to that, that, uh, you know, to have an awareness around mental health, you know, we all have mental health, uh, yet there's this massive confusion between mental health and mental illness. Uh, and, and there's a huge amount of t taboo stigma attached to this. So to be able to have co open conversations about mental health, some understanding of, of mental health and encouraging conversations uh, around that so that people are in a better position to reach out if they are struggling uh, and if they're not coping. Uh, because if you don't have a culture that is based on that level of compassion but understanding, um, everything goes everything goes underground and therefore you know that's where you get the presenteeism, the people who shouldn't be at work but are and are totally or well, very unproductive um, and and if you have a culture where conversation and an understanding is there uh, with compassion uh, it, it's a it's a much more open and better environment uh, for everyone top down absolutely everyone yeah Nick what's your thoughts yeah I, I think the point we know that 40 percent of people are unhappy in their job so therefore, with, with everything that's going on around us, with, with the home working, the pandemic situation, stress levels will only increase. Yeah. And I think if we talk about mental health, but we spend, and I spend quite a bit of my time talking about mental peak performance, how to train people to talk, think about themselves in a better light, to have a better mental self image, to be better prepared whether they're gonna run a, a 5K in world record time, or whether they're going to hit the targets next month. So we have a that mental health aspect in a positive point of view. But I think it's so important that we also support the reverse because this is when we get long-term sickness, absenteeism, yeah. and you know, and people, and, and, and I don't mind admitting it, oh, 20 odd years ago, I had a, a, a bout for about a year and I wasn't particularly well, but I was very lucky that my employers supported me and I had another good five or six years with that business in front of me because you know, and if you look after your teams in terms of their mental health, you'll have reduced sickness levels and reduced turnover and increased productivity. Yeah, so it yeah. just becomes a basic win-win, doesn't it? 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. So what, what are your thoughts, uh, Eileen, on, on implementing a, a network of mental health first aiders within, within a business? So I'm getting I'm getting a lot of information at the moment for, uh, on this idea of mental health first aiders from, from some research I'm doing um, currently into how how we might improve the efficacy of mental health first aiders in the workplace. It's a bit of a go to solution at the moment. And I, and I say that both positively and positively um, or possibly negatively as well. It's a bit of a tick box for some. Um, but actually, we do know, know that peer to peer support works and um, particularly when actually those who are giving that peer-to-peer -peer support also have their own lived experience. So um, I know from the research I've done so far that 75% of the people who volunteer to be a mental health first aider have their own lived experience, either direct or indirect. Yeah. So that makes them very effective, but it does also make them very vulnerable to potentially a, a trigger into their mental Ill health again, or, or possibly exacerbating a current, a current condition. So I think it's it's with with a couple of caveats. One, make sure that your mental health first aiders are really, really supported, because, of course, your duty of care extends to those as well as to the employees that they're supporting. And quite often, I think in most companies, there is very little visibility of what these first aiders are doing. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing this research, because how can we gain visibility without losing the confidentiality? How can we support them to be effective in their role? Because they are so passionate about trying to help that they often overstep the mark. And what we want to do is to try to contain them within the, the, the appropriate confines and boundaries of their role so we can protect them. But also there's an awful lot of insight that these first aiders have that would help a business know how best to then more effectively support the entire organization's well-being. And, 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 and just finally, a, a, a network of mental health first aiders has to be part of a strategic approach. It has to be integrated within a business. And you know, thanks to Deloitte's wonderful report, I'll quote them again, they have said that the, a characteristic of very successful interventions are those which are integrated across the entire organization. So again, it's how do we integrate first aiders into existing processes uh, within the organization? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll we'll and we'll touch on the, the strategy piece in it surely. Um, but that, that certainly feeds into that whole piece, doesn't it? Um, I mean, just Andy, just around uh, the issues faced by remote workers and and also their their managers. What what are they, and what sort of tips do you have for 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 managers um, who have remote teams? Well, I think there are there are a number of issues for people who work remotely. You know, uh, certainly conditions you work in, um, technology, um, you know, broadband connections can be flaky at the best of times. Um, uh, the the actual working conditions you have, if you're not if your setup isn't really suited to home working, um, you know, we we run training sessions where I've, I've literally training people who are, who are sitting on a bed for no other reason that's the only place in the house they can get a bit of peace and quiet but that's not a really good place to be working but I know for a fact that people do spend their working day on a bed um, uh, very noisy atmospheres um, multiple uh, you know um, uh, ownership or uh, you know lots of people working together again window on the world my unique position where I'm running training and seeing you know quite a lot going on in the background of a very small room where three people are working together and uh, you know when somebody speaks there's there's two other voices going in the background because it's just not geared up for 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 that that type of um uh, work and so it's it can become very stressful what can managers do uh, well, first of all, understand the conditions that that, that person has. Um, find maybe some solutions to help that person. Uh, if it's a long-term home working, you know, maybe that that the, the 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 manager could help with some of the technology challenges. Um, uh, and also just creating, a, I guess, a compassionate environment that um, allows for. Uh, rest times and, and you know some sort of assurance that it's taken um, supportive in the nature of lots of communication where it's where it's applicable uh, you know uh, making sure that um, people are listened to uh, and uh, and you know it, it's it's um, it's a world of, of better communication you can't just 
you know sit on your haunches and wait for things to 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 sort of unravel start on the front foot and and ask people what can i do to support you what do you need to be able to do your job effectively yeah yeah um nick what's your thoughts on that yeah i've got a few things i think um I, th I think it's trying to have a bit of a routine because because actually the home becomes your 24 seven home and office, isn't it really? So I think defining what your work hours are. So you make sure that you, you may, I mean, years ago before all of this started, there were stories of people who worked from home who had to leave the front door, walk around the block and come back in the front door. And that's when he started work. Yeah. Now that's that, that was a bit of a paradigm from years ago, but I think it's important to separate your work and your home life so it may, might be having being strict on your time and your hours and taking some exercise before and afterwards but also speak to your partner and try and work because if you've got children at home and maybe a partner working from home try and come up with some kind of working arrangement so at least some of you get some me time and also i think it's really really important when dining rooms or lounges can become offices to put the work away Hi, don't don't walk into the dining room with work still on the table and you're about to have tea. Try to find a place to put that work away, which isn't actually a bad practice full stop when you're back in the office because you can only work on one thing at any one time. But I think it's more exaggerated at home to try to separate the work and the life and the pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Eileen, what's your, what's your thoughts? So I think it comes down to the fact that we need a new operating model. You know, we, we are here now. This is, this is a new world that we are in. Yes, there may be still some adjustments to be made as we move to a more hybrid model, but it's a new operating model. Um, and the entrenched habits that we had in our old working pattern don't work. We need new habits. So it's about deciding what works for, for you, and, and I, I do agree that if you can almost manufacture an artificial commute where you go out and you do a little bit of exercise and come back in and now you're in work clothes possibly and you're in your death, fantastic. But actually for some people, it isn't a work-life divide, it's actually a blend. So as, as a working mum, for me, I, I don't really create distinctions. It really blends. And that works brilliantly for me because I can dip in and out. I don't do two at the same thing because I agree with you, Nick. No one can multitask, not, e not even as women. Hey. Um, <laughs> but I can't believe I've just said that, but I'm sorry, but it's true. We have to be able to focus on one thing at a time. Um, but it means that I can do a bit of that and then a bit of this. So I, I am present for every pickup. Um, that didn't used to happen because I used to be commuting up and down to London all the time. So I've actually got that work-life blend that I needed. And I wonder whether we need to be mindful of that as we move into a new operating model for lots and lots yeah. of people that actually they want to blend their work and their personal. Some don't. And I think that's what does make it challenging for businesses as they move into a new mm. operating model for yeah. all, all their people. It's going to be highly subjective. I'm so glad I'm not work I'm not the one working that out. But the one thing I would say is everybody's going to want something just a little bit different, but it's about meeting that need at the same time as meeting the business's need. You're going to have to bring these people together at some point because that's where you get your synergy. So yeah. it doesn't matter if they want to work from home all the time. Some people need to come together because of that potential a synergy of working together. And, and that to the managing of the, the, the hybrid working environment, which is where we're heading to, or, or you know, in some, some cases or many cases now they've moved to partially um, or all. But what 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 kind of challenges that does that throw up as opposed to just a, look after a remote team? It's difficult. It is actually genuinely very difficult. I mean, one of the things we said at the beginning of lockdown is, you know, figure out one, one of the things I talked a lot about in my training was, you know, figure out how you're going to communicate to your staff now. In fact, why don't you write down a list of all the times that you would normally communicate with your staff and it would be the odd remark there it'd be the water cooler moments it would be your yeah. one-to-ones it would be your project updates all the spontaneous communication as well you now need to diarize it you now need to make it not spontaneous and then you also need to check in on how much time that person wants to spend on a phone call or a zoom call with you because some people will want lots and they need a lot of engagement with you because they feel isolated Others actually will be completely overloaded with the amount of communication that's going on. Some people won't want to do all Zoom. Some people might actually want to walk and talk. 
So unfortunately, there, there, there isn't really a, a, a wonderful answer to this in the respect that, oh, we well, just need to do this. Mm. It is going to be quite complex and quite different. But I think one of the things that we often forget is that there's a business need here. We tend to talk about what does that person need? And although I'm a huge advocate for personal well-being and mental health, we also need to meet business objectives at the same time. So how can we blend that together? And I know that some organizations are looking at creating almost a timetable where certain teams will come in together on certain days and the rest of the time they're remote. So they're getting the right teams into the office at the right time, rather yeah. than saying to a member of staff, what days would you like to come into the office? Because there's no point him being in from marketing if the rest of the marketing team are all at home and they really kind of need to get together sometimes. But then we mustn't forget the weak tie communications at that water cooler, where actually you talk to people who are not in your department, and that's where you get an awful lot of value when you start to get that cross fertilization of ideas and mm -hmm. and um, and thought. So um, yeah, the manager's got to manage all of that, and that that isn't easy. So I think the more support we can give to the line managers, the better. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and it feeds quite nicely that into our. Uh, we've, we've got a question for the audience, and also we've got our poll poll results in. Um, and the question from the audience is around what does organizational best practice look like for mental well-being and then just to so i'll, I'll get your, your your thoughts on that in a second um and then from our poll um we've got a mixture but i would say the majority of of organizations or, or attendees of the, of the of this webinar um have a well-being strategy in place some don't um but i guess my, my question to you, to you all would be, okay, yeah, what does best practice look like and how do you achieve that? So, and Andy, what, what are your thoughts on that? So best practice, so that I think there is a huge um, differential between sort of entry level box ticking. I mean, you mentioned this earlier, Eileen, you know, that, that there is that risk that you just go, well, I think we should, should be doing this. And so we'll have a couple of people trained as mental health first aiders, um, which is fine as a starting point. But um, you, you know, what you're really looking for is a blended approach right the way across the business. And um, you know what what do you need first of all you know how do you evaluate where the gaps are where where are you in your journey and and what uh, what does your workforce feel that good could look like so you know getting people invested in uh, creating a strategy document or a strategy around best practice because it's going to be different from organization to organization. Um, if you have got full buy-in, I, I think again it's important talked about top down, but it's got to be endorsed by senior management and the and the and the re, you know the the benefits have got to be understood because they are very, very uh, well documented return on investment uh, stats, as, as Eileen was saying earlier. So, you know, it, it's it's not one size fits all. Um, it's, it's about getting the whole business involved in creating that strategy or certain elements of the business, um, uh, reaching out and making sure that um, everybody is, 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 is part of that. Um, measuring along the way to see, are, you know, setting goals, uh, are we achieving those goals? Do we move on to the next uh, next stage? And, and a very, very well laid out structure of how you go from where you are now to where you want to be. What is it, you, what is it, what's, what does that look like? And how are you gonna get there and with who? That's really the, 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 the process. Nate, what's your thoughts? It's talking purely on well-being now, or just a mental health issue, um, Jonathan. Uh, I suppose, it, from an organisational perspective, what what, um, what what does good look like as far as a, a well-being strategy is concerned? Well, uh, well, it's interesting you say that because I've been thinking about this this quite hard actually, and I think there's there's a number of distinct pillars. But but what COVID has made us do and is look at this in more detail when actually it should be there in the first place place it should be nothing new and i'm talking first of all we talk about health and mental health clearly but workload has an impact on people's health as well so are we giving people the right workloads my, ne my next point is about security and we're almost this almost maps into maslow's hierarchy of needs so we talk security what are the working conditions like what's the financial security like what's the package like are people comfortable 
What about the environment, the facilities we offer people and the tools to do the job and the work pattern as in shift patterns? But also in terms of the environment, what is the culture? Because, you know, you can, you can have all the nice things about a wellness practice or well-being practice. What is the company culture? What's it like? What do we expect? How do we get buy-in? And then we talk about relationships, because I mentioned teams earlier on and people want to be part of a team. So relationships with your line manager, are you getting the right support? Are you getting the right direction? But relationships with the team in its own right, have got a proper teamship society. And what is the purpose? What's the job fit? And what's the progression for that purpose? So actually, well-being covers all of those and they should be part of the fabric of what we what we are doing to be a good company anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eileen, what are you, what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of re reflect on some of the things that Nick was saying, because he's, he's almost creating there a framework that, that goes around the five drivers of well-being. So I think a strategic approach should have a framework. That framework could be the five drivers of well-being. You look at all the different elements underneath there. Um, and then from there, I think it's looking about looking at what is material within that framework for your organization. So no, no one size fits all. Um, is the, um, the security going to be one of the top issues? For example, um, that, that can be physical security. You're in a high hazard environment. Or is it financial security where the demographic of your organization means that lots of people are low paid? Um, so it, it isn't one size fits all, of course, but that framework will give you something to go off to actually do a bit of an audit in terms of well, what's important to your employees. That might also, as Andy says, actually involve asking your employees as well. So they co-design that program with you. But very importantly, whatever strategy you put in place has to have two things. It has to land within the right cultural environment. So there's got to be no contradictions with things like a complete lack of paternity policy, for example, um, or it might have a rigorous performance reward structure that is entirely based on um, achievement of objectives which are entirely financial. Um, you know, so there's got to be no contradiction when it is actually in integrated into the organization. And then secondly, it needs that leadership, not just buy-in, but they need to role model it. They need to demonstrate it. The most powerful of mental health programs that you have seen in businesses to date have been led and championed from the very, very top through disclosure. So I'm not saying we, we you know, we're best practices, you've got to have someone at the top who's had a mental health condition and has had to disclose it and leave. But what I am saying is it's, it's, it's the humility, it's the authenticity, and it's the demonstration that it's okay to not be okay by the most senior level, which will have the most significant impact on people trusting that they can disclose their mental health and they will still be valued as a member of staff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose it's, it's translating a strategy into a, a way of working as well. So you can build a strategy, but it's only as good as the paper is written on if it's, if it's not properly implemented and people don't buy into that. Um, Can I just say on that, actually, because I've, I've this research I'm doing into mental health first aiders, I was talking to an organisation that's got 400 mental health first aiders, so it's a big construction firm, yeah. and um, the research says that these guys are not active, they're just not active. Now, I'm able to tell through the research why. The top reason it would seem that these mental health first aiders are not particularly active in their role <clears throat> is closed culture. So there is a perfect example that you need to have it integrated. It needs to be a strategic approach and it needs to land into the right cultural context. So yeah. they've spent tens of thousands of pounds training up mental health first aiders and these first aiders can't do their job because everyone's too frightened to disclose. Yeah. And yeah. culture, you know, culture, this is where having an open environment, you know, uh, at any one time, 25% of us will experience poor mental health, you know, uh, and m mental health and physical health are inextricably linked. And the fact that it's still at this stage, you know, in 2021, a, a, you know, a, a taboo, the stigmatized, you know, if you can have an, a, a, an environment where you can talk openly um, or at least expect to be listened to and not discriminated against when you reveal that you are struggling, that's the first stage, really. I agree with you, Eileen. You know, you can put all the mental health first aiders in place that you want, but if, if nobody's comfortable about talking and there's not, not a sort of compassion, compassionate vein running through the company, it's money wasted. It won't work. 
but you see construction that it's i'm going to be stereotypical here it one perceives construction as being a macho society and therefore you know it comes back to dare i talk about this because this is a macho culture it's construction yeah and, and honestly nick you know and, and just to, you know the, on that point you know in terms of and the thing we just never want to talk about is suicide but in terms of suicide stats 75 percent male and 25% female complete suicide. You know, this is huge differential between men and women who take their lives. And I, I, that I, as a society, we have to do something to address two, it. Two, two, two friends of mine, one about 25 years ago, one about 15 years ago, both school friends have committed suicide. And mm. I never saw either coming. And I, and I look back sometimes with regret and think, I should have seen it, I should have seen it. Mm. And I didn't there, are some, there are certain demographics that are more vulnerable and one is absolutely the the the, the male gender because of um this macho image and, and unfortunately absolutely andy that that disproportion um of those who do take their lives it's male but actually in the construction industry the rate of suicide is three times higher than any other industry Gosh. Yeah. so so i mean how do you how do you build a culture which is going to be open how do you, what do you do? What do you put in place to, to create a successful working culture? Because obviously with contact centers, you know, you've got people joining the business, um, new starters, it's trying to get them integrated into, into, into the values, I suppose, and understanding how the, the organization runs. But what's, what's your tips on, on that? What do you think, how, how do you approach that as an organization? I mean, one, one of the things I look at when I start to work with an organization is corporate values. Um, and then, you know, get a sense of, well, are they really understood and held by each individual? Um, I've worked with an organization who's got a value of stand side by side. And interestingly, the value is about being jointly responsible for delivery and performance. And of course, I've got hold of that value and gone, no, 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 let's, let's really big this up let's stand by side by side and support each other. So I think one of the, you know, does, does compassion, does empathy, does support, does human really live and breathe in the organization? Organizations are made up of people. That is it, they're, they're people at the end of the day. So really our, the, the corporate values have to be people values. Um, otherwise they're not gonna be delivered. So I think one of the, the most critical elements that a, that a company has got to get right is that if they have got these corporate values, that they, they, they speak to this need to be human. And if they're too much, in fact, I heard, I heard the chief medical officer of BP talking about this, where he said he recognized that their performance reward structure wasn't rewarding things like support, integrity, trust. So they had to start to change their values and then also make them work within the organization. So actually people would be rewarded for just being good human beings. Now I know we shouldn't have to do that, but it stopped people driving for results at, at all costs. Cause that of course, isn't what we want. Cause ultimately in the long term, that isn't sustainable for a business anyway. No, no, absolutely. Uh, I suppose the other thing is because a company may be thinking they're doing well, but if they're not gauging satisfaction correctly, then they be they could be completely off track. Um, Amanda, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, is what's the best way of gauging satisfaction? Well, I I think you ask um, regularly. You you run polls, anonymized polls with the workforce, uh, by creating a culture that doesn't uh, suspect, uh, you know, foul play, as it were. So if if uh, you know, I think there's some really interesting stats like companies that have EAP systems, employee assistance programs, um, very few people actually use them. Um, that's evidenced. And, and one of the reasons is that they don't trust that it's not going to be fed back to the business. So you've got to get rid of this sort of paranoia. So if you are asking questions of people, they have to trust that they can be open and honest and not just toe the party line. Uh, and then you and then as you're going through developing your strategy, you keep asking questions and you keep building a picture of of the evolution and well, hopefully the success of the strategy you're bringing in. But if you don't ask, you, you will not know. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's an interesting one. And I think it, 
in some respects, it comes back to recruitment. And does our recruitment model change in the future? Because if we're talking purely on home working as well, for example, one of my sons is working from home. He works in a contact center, but he's working from home. Now, some people have the right traits or better traits to work from home than others. So I think he's quite self-motivated. I think he's quite conscientious, but he's also quite laid back. So it's kind of what is the right person to fit that bill? So I'm almost going across a couple of different questions here about hybrid models as well. Is the hybrid model having the right people that can work at home? But it goes back to a values led organization when you first recruit people, because you can re recruit people on what they, you think that you will, they will deliver for you as a business in terms of results and at, at whatever the company is striving to achieve. But what will they also bring for you in terms of ethics and values and compassion and core? And are we, because I interviewed recently the ex chief exec of Hobbycraft. And she said the biggest failing in any business is recruiting people for the sake of it, only recruit the very best people. So what does very best mean in this situation? And you have to decide then what are the values you want from that person? Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, perspective there. Um, just, just, I mean, talking about individuals, I mean, how, how do you, how would you motivate a remote worker? What are your, your thoughts, Nick? Obviously your, your background with uh, athletics and, and yeah, I, I, I training. Think you see, one of the things I always say is that what's the definition of motivation? Well, you can't be motivated unless you've got powerful goals in life. And then who sets the goals? Is it the employee or is it the leader? It's got to be both, of course. And I use a model called the tear cycle, which is how our thinking affects our emotions, the actions we take and the results we get. But the problem we get too often is that results are expected, actions are given, emotions not considered, and thinking doesn't even come into it. So I think it's, it's, it's a joint um, coming together. And what I, what's, in quite, what's quite impressed me with Luke's company is that they um, have a, use a perk box. And every now and then they send out a little prezi. I know things are tough at the moment. We really appreciate your input. Now this comes down to how well does the leader know the employee? Not just on a business footing in terms of KPIs, but how well does he know them? Why do I say that? Luke got uh, eight tins of Stella. Yeah, so from his perk box to the point where, and he felt chuffed he felt valued he felt you know he felt he meant something um so i think it's 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 talking to people more often but actually praise should only be done for the sake of it but saying please thank you and i think use of name jonathan this is going so well thanks for your input i think it's so important it sounds a bit twee but people love please thank you and use of the name yeah 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 eileen what, what do you think well, that makes me think of the fact that people people want to feel like they're contributing. I mean, yeah. talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there is this this level of need for us to feel that we are valued, that we have a purpose. So first off, if you want to motivate someone, then let's get that purpose defined clearly. Let's see what the bigger picture is, and then let's define what their contribution is to that bigger picture. And then it's about celebrating perhaps even more so than normally those small successes yeah. and, 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 and praising and thanking for that. I think a lot of line managers perhaps traditionally believe it's about driving employees to do more and critiquing their work. And I think you get an awful lot more out of people if you can praise them for the good stuff that they do. But purpose is one of the key drivers of well-being within the workplace. So if we can define that purpose um, I mean, it's like, this, was it Kennedy who said, uh, walking around NASA and he said to someone, you know, what's your job here? And he went, I'm putting someone on the moon. And he was sweeping the floor. You know, yeah. what's that bigger picture and how do we define that person's role so they know the contribution they're making to that bigger picture? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, just, just, I think, another area I think is around work-life balance. Because um, everyone sees... When we talk about remote working, home working, there's, there's sometimes a negative spin on it. Oh, yeah, people sat at home watching TV. You know, reality is there's the other side of it where you get people who actually, and sometimes I'm guilty of this, where where you, you work more because you, you can't escape it. Um, so there's no switch off. Your, 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 your desk's there, your, your computer's there. I'll, I'll pick up my laptop, I'll, I'll do something in the evening. So, so, so Andy, what, what are your sort of tips around controlling that work-life balance and, and making sure that people don't, don't swing one way? 
Well, I guess a bit of structure is good. Um, and, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, that sort of transition between work and home. And, you know, for some people like you, Eileen, it works very well to sort of blend for other people, maybe not so. So, you know, where do I fit in? What's the, you know, what's, what suits me the best? How, how do I, uh, how do I manage best? Um, if you are someone who likes that sort of clear delineation, um, and, and I'm, kind of one of those people um, so so make sure that you've got uh, if you can set working days I think the the real challenge is mission creep so you you know if you say well I, you know I'm going to finish at six o'clock and you're still there at eight o'clock you know if it's a deadline and it's got to be you know delivered piece of work but what I found when I first started working from home I would be working, I suddenly realized I was working colossal hours because I'd have a bit to eat and then I'd come back into the office and I'd, and I'd you know, do some more and then suddenly you get sort of swept along with it. So I think it's about setting very, very clear um, working days, if you can. Um, uh, take care of your health um, and, you know, the, the idea of sort of taking time out, you know, having, having regular breaks. <laughs> Um, but also having that, um, I finish, uh, you know, in the evening and I take my dog out because that helps me to clear my, my mind down. So there are all sorts of things you can do to make sure that your, your work life doesn't too much encroach on your home life and vice versa. Um, but also things like achieve, achieve you know, give yourself achievable um, uh uh, schedules so that you're not going I've got to clear this list because you know uh, you know I've said I would and it's 11 o'clock at night um, and work smart not hard you know just just be be your own um, time time management expert so a few things but there are many many things you can do to uh, to establish a really good positive work-life balance uh, and and, it, and I don't think it happens overnight I think you have to sort of find out what what who you are and what works best for you and actually, I mean, just on that, um, you've touched on the 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 the, 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 the exercise element, and um, I know Nick, you do a lot of work around this the peak mental performance and exercise, and and how, how that all feeds into it. What what's your what's your you know? Are you going to give us a bit more information around that? And yeah, yeah I mean, I, I talk about the mental side, obviously first of all. Um, we, we know that 90 percent of performance is about what happens up here. And a lot of it comes from our conditioning, which which drives our beliefs, our attitudes, our feelings and emotions, and ultimately our behavior. So we have to change our self-talk. And it goes back a little bit to something that Eileen said, which where I started the conversation. I always say to people, at the end of the week, you've probably been brilliant for 95% of the time. Drop the ball once or twice, the 5%. What happens? You beat yourself up about the 5% and you don't pat yourself on the back about the 95%. And then in terms of setting goals, which excite, I was once with a premiership football referee and in walked um, a guy who'd just been appointed to the football league as a referee. We asked him what his goals were. He said to referee a World Cup final. That's a vision 20 years hence. And it comes back, as Eileen said, to setting small little goals. Celebrate success on the journey. Celebrate those small wins. And that will help a lot in terms of your own self-talk because our self-talk, we live our lives on our perceptions of reality, not reality itself. Yeah, yeah. Eileen, what are your thoughts on that? So uh, apparently it takes 66 days to create a new habit. And I imagine at the beginning of lockdown, we thought, well, I'm not creating a new habit. I'm not going to be here that long. And then we'll all go back to work. So perhaps many of us didn't create new habits. But I think we know that life is very different now. Our working patterns have changed and will continue to be a bit more of this and that, a bit of a hybrid. So we need a new operating model. We need new habits. So if you haven't started making those new habits, and it's all so subjective. I, someone um, told me that she has started at the beginning of every single day to write down one thing that she's super proud of. So not the 5%, Nick, the 95%. She pops that down on a piece of Absolutely. paper, writes, writes it down. And she said, actually, it's had such a massive impact mm. on her mindset. The other thing that she does is that she doesn't book any appointments before 9.30. Great, if, that, if that's something you can do. And instead, she goes out and has thinking time. 
I don't know why I need to do this. Um, she has thinking <laughs> time, and um, it's um, I've done a little bit of that. Not 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 all the time. I did it this morning because I just had the luxury of no appointments till ten, and um, I had a thought. I've had a really good idea. So you know th that's one of the habits I'm trying to create. And um, so I would encourage you to find what works for you, and then make it into a habit because. So it's something like 40% of our day is made up of habits, i.e. stuff we don't even think about, we just do it. So there's no point trying to master this with, with determination and willpower, because it's like saying, right, I'm gonna join a gym and become really super fit and have a six pack by July. Um, it, it's not gonna work. No, you know, How many people keep up with those gym memberships? We don't. So the idea is don't count on willpower, instead, make it ingrained, make it more of a habit, and 66 days sounds a, a really long time. So you know what? Let's start with day one and see how we get on. Yeah. yeah and yeah. just one thing I just wanted to mention there, because there was some really good stuff there. And, uh, you know, Nick, your points there about self-talk. But the, the problem with self-talk is that we can be harsher on ourselves than we would ever <laughs> dream of being to someone else. We, yeah. t we talk to ourselves in a way that is, is horrendous. And I think we've talked about compassion and compassionate environments, but actually let's think about self-compassion. Let's be kind to ourselves. Let's, let's be aware when life is tough and, and learn to kind of sit with the sadness. It's very important that we don't drive ourselves too hard. So self-compassion, start to practice that. 66 days to practice and, and feel self-compassion. I'm really on day one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they talk about affirmations and, and uh, our conditioning. We are creatures of habit. So we are going to the, 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 the psychological detail. We have dendrites in our brain, how we transmit our thoughts. But you have to start to change your own self-talk before you can get there. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Um, OK, so we're mindful of time now. We're coming towards the end of the session. But what, what I'd really like to get from the three of you, is just just your uh, tips around sort of do's and don'ts of managing teams from afar, from a, from a well-being mental health perspective. Um, do, you want to, do you want to kick things off, Nick? Yeah, I, I, I think it's regular dialogue, but without going into minutia and, and, and micromanaging. It's difficult in terms of picking up on body language and emotional intelligence, but it's trying for, to look for those underlying signals, which something isn't quite right here as well, isn't it? But it, it is communication and make the person feel valued. Right. Uh, Andy? Uh, yeah. So um, if you can spot those signs of people struggling, I totally agree with Nick there. Uh, trust your teams. You know, don't. Uh, that's where micromanaging comes from when you don't trust your teams. Um, um, and, um, you know, set some expectations and manage those expectations so people know where where they are. Um, but really importantly, encourage social interactions. Um, make sure that you, you allow that people can have those um, uh, those sort of water cooler moments as best you can, but in a, in a remote way, um, in, encourage uh, teams to not just talk about work necessarily, but uh, to have ways that they can bond. And I think all of those will start to develop a sort of cohesive group of people that feel more part of something rather than a disparate sort of uh, satellite somewhere, you know, in, in a living room in, 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 a, in a town near you. Right. And, and finally, Eileen. I'm going to go back to relationships. So the line managers, they are critical to everybody's, um, um, to employee, everybody's well-being. So invest in your line managers so they know what their role is and how to fulfill it. But also invest in supporting your line manager as well, because their well-being is also really, really important. And chances are, if they're middle managers, they're somewhere around mid-career. They're somewhere, therefore, probably at the bottom of the bell curve when you look at well-being across the lifespan. So actually, they need a lot of help as well. So help them, and then they will be able to help others. And Andy, very quickly, we don't talk about outsourcing to India anymore. It's outsourcing to a flat near you. <laughs> That's it, yes. <laughs> the new world order. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, so anyway, on, on that note, uh, you will, uh, we'll, we'll finish the session today, but it's been, uh, been really interesting from my perspective. I hope the audiences have enjoyed it as much as, uh, as, much as I have, and uh, I, I much appreciate all the input from the panellists today. 
And um, if if you are, if anyone wants to watch this again, the, the coffee table conversations as, we, as we've coined it, um, we're going to publish the the video afterwards uh, the next day or so. Um, we'll send an email out to all those who have attended the details. Um, if you don't get the email, you'll be able to find it online on our website or our YouTube channel. Um, we've got a we've got a small survey at the end of this of this session. Uh, if you could give us your feedback, that would be much appreciated. Um, you know, your thoughts are always always taken on board, and uh, and and just also um, we've run a couple of other sessions around well well being or well being actually home working even and um, and and they're they're available also on our YouTube channel, um, so you can find those if you want to uh, listen listen in on previous previous debates. Um, but yeah, on, on that note, I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Enjoy the sun over the next few days because it's going to be nice. And uh, and hopefully you'll tune in again soon. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.